Thank you, Wendy, and definitely thank you um, for the invitation to come and talk about um, my work. And as Wendy has sort of talked about it, I think it really is a mission. And so you'll understand a little bit more, um, probably as all the panelists will talk about what we do and some of the challenges that we experience. But also hopefully are giving you a little bit of insights, a little bit of um, things that work and some opportunities that we see to actually advance and reduce some of the risk in um, particular populations. So again, today I'm going to talk primarily about rural communities here domestically within the U.S. and particularly in the Deep South. So um, I'm going to talk uh, in, in terms of the successes and the programs about a couple of studies that have been funded by the NCI, but want to make sure I'm very clear that these are my comments and suggestions and not those of the NIH. So I want to talk about, very briefly, um, what are the roles of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity in cancer prevention, then talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are in maintaining these healthy lifestyles in rural communities, and then lastly talk about, again, the opportunities for cancer prevention in rural communities and hopefully inspire you to, to get involved in some of this work as well. So again, probably no need to talk about this in this room, but we all know about um, you know, cancer being a leading cause of death in the United States, and close to 600,000 individuals um, will are estimated to have died from ca um, cancer every year. Beyond the loss of life, which is obviously very important to most of us, as was mentioned earlier, there's a significant economic cost as well, both in terms of healthcare expenditures, but also in lost productivity. So again, there is a number of reasons why we want to address and prevent cancer as much as possible. So this is a map. Um, we've seen a lot of maps today, but this is one in particular that looks at the age-adjusted death rates for the United States in 2011 for all particular cancer sites. And in particular here, what I want to draw your attention to is that, again, while there is a pervasive amount of cancer occurring throughout the U.S., there are certain areas of the country in which there is what we call an unequal burden of cancer. And that typically lies within the Deep South region and where I work in particular. So when we talk about that region, um, we also know that a large number of those states have a high population that live in rural settings. And that's particularly important because rural, residents of rural areas may experience a higher risk of cancer for a number of reasons. Um, limited health care facilities and other resources have already been talked about in terms of both primary care but also specialty care may place individuals in these communities at higher risk. We also know about issues of lack of transportation or limited transportation. So if you're thinking about um, even when there exist um, some facilities, they oftentimes are miles and miles and miles away, and there's not as much mass transit and other ways to get to those facilities as needed. We also are talking about a population that tends to be um, have a higher rate of poverty and low income, um, people who spend a lot of their time working. So the options to go in for preventive services um, and take time off from work. Someone mentioned earlier about you know having to take a sick day. That's oftentimes a little bit more difficult when you're in rural settings than in other places then that also leads to a, a greater focus on treatment rather than prevention. So if you're working long hours, um, you don't have a great way to get transported to your facilities, then you typically go in, and the folks that we work in, they go in when something is obviously broken, bleeding, where you can't stop it. Something is really, really obvious, not the idea that I'm going to go in and sort of prevent something that maybe may or may not happen a long time from now. And then also, as we've talked about already today, higher rates of obesity and tobacco use. So then you, we've talked about a number of things, and we know the biological and genetic mechanisms that might increase people's risk for cancer. But I want to focus in here about a couple of things in terms of health behaviors that we also know may be linked to a number of cancers. So a healthy diet, for example, is linked um, to helping to sustain a healthy weight as well as lower risk of cancer. We also know about regular physical activity, and it protects against the buildup of excess body fat and also may independently fight against cancer. And then lastly, um, weight management or overweight and obesity has um, contributed to an estimated as much as 20% of all cancer-related deaths. 
So just walking through a couple of those risk factors for you again in a series of maps. The first one here is the percent of adults in the U.S. age 18 and older who reported consuming fruit less than one time a day. So if you all remember, there have been tons of campaigns um, nationally about increasing fruits and vegetables and anywhere from five to nine fruits and vegetables a day. These are individuals across the state that are self-reporting that they only they eat less than one um, fruit a day um, from the 2013 data. So if, again, if you think about the previous map that I showed about unequal burden of cancer, some of these same states are highlighted here with the darkest color, meaning um, greater than um, 50% of the population here are indicating that they were not eating um, more than one fruit a day. Similarly, this is the map of the individuals who reported vegetable eating, consuming vegetables less than one time daily. So again, very similar in terms of the communities that are highlighted, and they tend to be areas in which, again, many of us work in in the Deep South and areas where there are lots of rural population. So what are some of the challenges to healthy eating, particularly in rural settings? Um, so typically, in terms of the, the previous um, panel and talking about social and cultural issues, a lot of times in rural communities, larger portion sizes are served at what is considered to be these family meals or family dinners. Part of this is in a cultural sense of con you know, having a lot of food there. Some of it may be tied to an expression of love and caring by, by, by um, having an abundance of food. Some of it has to do with food insecurity. So individual families not knowing when that next meal might be there. So they are oftentimes um, you know, having lots of meals at a, at lots of food at the meal at a time. We also know that there's limited access to affordable foods, um, sometimes that small grocers may be um, um, present in these areas and where they may not have as large a variety or the cost may be higher, um, or there may be an abundance of convenience stores if there is something there at all. So in Wendy's um, slide, she showed sort of, you know, just opposed the, the healthier foods, the lean meats and the fresh vegetables, as opposed to the canned processed meats and, and potato sticks. And then more recently, um, one of our colleagues at UAB um, led a study that was published um, looking at the southern dietary pattern in particular, which is characterized by added fats and fried foods, eggs, organ and processed meats, and sugar-sweetened beverages, and linked that with an association of an increased risk of chronic disease. So again, in terms of the culture related to eating healthy, the physical environment in terms of eating healthy, there are a number of challenges that um, individuals who live in these rural communities might face. So the other risk factor that I mentioned before is, is about relates to physical activity. So this is a map that's showing the um, county level estimates of leisure time physical inactivity among adults age 20 and over in 2011. So again, looking here, you see again the very similar pattern in terms of lots of physical inactivity with the darkest blue here, meaning greater than or equal to 32.6% of the um, population are reporting physical inactivity um, in, the, in the last several days. And we also know that there are geographic differences, so not only by state and county level, but in terms of um, rurality. So about a fourth of the U.S. population are individuals that live in rural settings, and we know that physical inactivity is um, greatest among individuals who live in the, in the rural areas and in the rural south in particular. So what are some challenges to activity or active living in rural settings? Um, so again, issues are related to limited access, so sometimes there are not um, facilities, there are very few parks and recreational facilities, or when they exist, again, they may be a significant distance away from where individuals live. So people are spread out, um, they may not be able to get there, the limited uh, transportation may also prohibit them from utilizing those resources when they are there. We also know the built environment is um, not as conducive in many of these areas, so there's limited connectivity. So people get out and they move around when they live and they have places to go, when, when um, city centers are connected to housing, are connected to schools and so forth. But when you have sidewalks that go nowhere or you don't have sidewalks, people are less likely to get out and do um, be physically active. Then there's also an issue of highways. So many of the rural areas are, you know, have highways 
going right through them. Um, and there are connectors in where you have, you know, um, a lot of um, trucks going through high speeds and so forth. So even when people do get out and they want to walk, they may feel that it's not as safe because of the traffic patterns that exist. And then there's issues of infrastructure. So these are um, three pictures that are taken from some of the communities that we work in. So even when there is a park nearby, because of the drainage and the poor infrastructure, it oftentimes floods. So most of the time it's not accessible to individuals even though it's there. Or again, the, the woman in the middle who's walking along where there's not a sidewalk or a buffer. Um, and if that's a major thoroughfare, that may not be something that she feels comfortable um, walking in is not a safe opportunity. And then lastly, just in general, there's not a lot of funds left over for infrastructure and um, street maintenance and so forth. And then lastly, the risk factor of overweight and obesity. So Wendy showed sort of globally where things are. This is a map looking at um, self-reported obesity within the U.S. and looking at um, uh, BRFS data from CDC in 2014. So again, um, some of the very same um, um, states that are identified as having higher burden of cancer are also picking up here and having the highest rates of overweight and obesity. So then what do we do about it? So what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about the work that myself and other colleagues at UAB have been engaged in over funding from the NCI for over 15 years. Um, it's a very unique partnership at, called the Deep South Network for Cancer Control that involves a 15-year uh, collaboration between academic researchers, health professionals, and specialists, local leaders, and community volunteers across Alabama and Mississippi. Um, the focus here has been on eliminating cancer disparities by conducting community-based participatory research um, that focuses on not only the research, but also training a cadre of other investigators to continue this work work and also doing education and outreach. Um, at the cornerstone of this work has been cancer outreach and screening, so making sure that individuals are aware of um, the guidelines and recommendations that are out there, connecting them with opportunities to be screened and as needed opportunities for treatment. It's also been about um, promoting healthy behaviors like nutrition and physical activity and weight management. Um, and then also training, again, not only um, academic researchers, but also training individual community members and increasing capacity to do this work long term. So I mentioned the community-based participatory research, and some of this conversation um, came up earlier this morning. But what we're talking about here is this equitable partnership. So academic um, researchers as well as community members are in this fight together where they're equitably talking about what are the issues, um, what do we want to focus on, how will we go about this, what are the approaches that are ideal. Um, they also help in terms of data collection and interpretation. So it's a partnership through and through. And in talking about the research that's been funded through the Deep South Network and some of the other spinoff projects, um, it really has been a process where individuals are collectively coming together to identify the research questions, to write the grant applications, and also to ensure that funding sort of goes and goes directly to community members to do the work. The other cornerstone of the Deep South Network has been this issue of community health advisors as research partners. So a couple of people mentioned earlier this morning about the idea of identifying indigenous individuals who are lay health providers um, that, that live in the communities to be trained to do the work that um, we are focusing on. And so that's exactly what happened. During the first five years of funding from NCI, a large part of this network was built in identifying individuals and community leaders where they were trained on cancer prevention and control and also subsequently trained on different interventions. And that has been the cornerstone of what we do, and it's really allowed us to build trust over the last 15 years and to deliver some very intensive interventions more recently. So I want to highlight two, um, two clinical trials in which uh, one just recently completed the Journey to Better Health trial, and the other one is an R01 that's ongoing, the DSN um, CARES project. 
across each of these trials, which are focused on weight management, they've been embedded within this long-term academic community partnership that's focused on eliminating cancer disparities, particularly between blacks and whites in Alabama and Mississippi. Um, they've also focused on uh, behavioral weight loss interventions that were adapted from already existing evidence-based programs that have shown to um, promote um, clinically relevant weight loss among populations that have been quite diverse. So these are studies like from the DASH trials, the weight loss maintenance trial, DPP, all the ones that had the, all the bells and whistles, a lot of funding going into them, but they were fundamentally different in terms of who was delivering the interventions. The interventions in those other trials were primarily led by individuals with a lot of academic training, sort of dietitians, psychologists, behavioral scientists, and so forth. And what we chose to do was adapt this so that it could be delivered by our non-professional uh, community health advisors and um, staff within each of the counties that we work in. We also wanted to embed this group-based weight loss program within a larger multi-level intervention. So each of these trials involve um, community strategies that were selected, again, from evidence-based models and de delivered by local government or community-based organizations to do something about those challenges in the built environment that may make it more difficult for individuals in these areas to eat healthy and to get regular opportunities for physical activity. So the community strategies that we really focused on were from CDC um, several years ago, pr produced the recommended community strategies and measurements to prevent obesity in the United States. Um, using our CBPR model, we focused with our advisory board to identify things within that guideline that would be appropriate for individuals living in rural communities. So we sort of came up with a menu, if you will, of different strategies that our local um, organizations could take on to help to promote physical activity and healthy eating within their, within their communities. And so we awarded many grants to local communities to expand farmers markets and community gardens, um, to provide incentives to far get farmers markets purchases like double bucks and things of that nature to encourage citizens to come out and get more produce. Um, we also funded park improvements, so things like putting pavilions in, putting benches, um, putting um, markers to help people to realize how many miles and how many laps around they need to go to get mileage. Um, park that had um, recreational programs and so forth were also built, built in to increase people's activities and then indoor walking trails as well. So if you've been in the Deep South, particularly in the southern, um, in the, the summer months, you know that it's pretty hot um, to do a lot of outdoor activities. So we wanted to make sure that year round people had opportunities for physical activity. And so one of the other things that we, we learned um, across these programs is that we have a significant reach. So a lot of times people talk about African Americans or people living in rural areas as being hard to reach, but we have not experienced that. For the first trial, the Journey to Better Health trial, which has recently ended, we actually enrolled 409 women um, who were overweight and obese. They were African American women who resided in one of eight um, counties, part of the Deep South Network. And to get those 409 enrolled, we actually touched and reached over 900 women um, to screen them and give them some initial outreach and educational information. Um, we also retain them in this two-year intervention um, with great success with having almost everyone stay around for the six-month and 12-month intervention. And even at the two-year point, we had 75% of the women who were still actively involved in the trial. The other trial, the DSN Care study, is ongoing. Um, we have met 50% of our target enrollment of 450 cancer survivors and family members. Again, very high retention at those um, communities that have reached the initial follow-up period. We have, we're experiencing about a 98% retention among those individuals. And they're recruited, again, by these are local community health advisors who are volunteers as well as local um, part-time paid staff where they are employees of the university, but they live in the communities in which they work. Um, some very brief things about what we know about our outcomes. Um, so we're seeing clinically significant weight loss at the end of six months, both in our two treatment arms, both the intervention by itself, as well as the intervention plus community strategies. Um, we're seeing the weight loss being clinically, clinically significant, as well as other improvements like weight circumference, blood pressure, 
total cholesterol and triglycerides um, at that time period. So again, um, one of the main things that we think this is particularly impactful is because if you remember, these are evidence-based programs, but they, they've been translated not to be delivered by nurses or um, behavioral scientists or dietitians, but we're using actual individual volunteers and lay health providers to deliver this curriculum, and they're getting um, comparable success as some of these other trials. So generally in concluding about um, what we've learned through these, these studies, we know that CBPR methods are associated with significant reach of this target population. Again, it historically has been hard to reach. Um, we also know that these multi-level interventions for cancer prevention can be effectively implemented by non-professional local staff and volunteers. Um, our findings suggest initial improvements also in health outcomes and good potential for program sustainability. So again, we're not providing a, a great deal of effort beyond training and providing them with resources. There's a manualized curriculum and we're embedding this within other local organizations to make sure that even when our funding runs out that they're able to be sustained over time. So in general, what do we know about doing um, these kinds of prevention projects in rural areas? We know that in, there's very limited research, I think it was mentioned earlier this morning, very limited published research targeting cancer prevention in rural communities um, domestically or internationally. So we don't know a whole lot. Um, so what, part of what we need to do is actually do more work in this area. We also know the long-term impact, we don't know the long-term impacts and sustainability of existing programs. Again, the one like the ones that we're doing are, are very unique and are new. Um, we need to follow these over time to see, in fact, um, what their long-term impact and sustainability might look like. And we also don't know what the key factors might be to support programs with limited traditional resources. So things like access to primary care and cancer centers are limited, so we don't know, in fact, what would support these kinds of programs when you're in those areas. What we can do right now, though, is to increase our efforts to target rural communities for cancer prevention research and practice. We can take advantage of community engagement to develop and implement programs that meet the unique needs and resources of rural communities. And we can also seize opportunities within the Affordable Care Act, for example, to engage community health workers and other non-licensed professionals in the provision of preventive services. And we need to evaluate these programs. Okay, thank you.